Yes. Well, all, right. all right, great. <laughs> Thank you so okay. much. So, no problem. Just as a disclaimer for everyone, uh, we are recording this webinar because we get a lot of requests from people um, wanting to uh, check check in on us uh, and our, our professional development events. So um, we encourage you to share your cameras if, you, if you'd like. We'd love to see your faces and reactions and make sure you're there with us. Um, so I just want to welcome everybody. Thank you so much for taking time on this uh, Saturday morning. Um, my name is uh, Claudia Carco. I'm the Interim Assistant Dean of ESL at Westchester Community College. Uh, I'm here joined by my colleague, Leslie Painter Farrell, who uh, is the mastermind behind these uh, webinar series. So we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. Um, so thank you, Leslie, for doing this and organizing. It does take a lot of her time, um, but it's, we believe it's time well spent. Um, we are joined here, of course, by our distinguished um, speaker today, uh, uh, Lourdes Ortega, um, or should I say Lourdes Ortega, right? <laughs> and, either way, uh, whatever either you way. <laughs> Yeah, that is your name, right? Um, and Lourdes is a professor um, in the Department of Linguistics at Georgetown, Georgetown University. Um, as you all know, she's well known for, um, you know, or her, or her articles, her books, uh, one of which we use in our TESOL certificate program. So I, I told Lourdes before we started that she's a celebrity in our program. So we're super excited that she took the time of, out of her um, schedule to do this for us. Um, she's also best known for an award-winning meta-analysis of second language instruction, which was published in the year 2000. Um, and she is the current president-elect of the American Association for Applied Linguistics. Um, she's originally from Spain, and she lived and worked as a language teacher in Greece for most of her 20s, and has lived in the United States since 1993, and mentored and researched in Hawaii, Arizona, Georgia, and currently in Washington, D.C. So without further ado, I pass on the baton to you, Lourdes. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, Claudia. And I'm going to share my screen and get uh, the presenter mode on. Great, so now I don't see anyone, but I hope everyone can see me and hear me. Can someone unmute themselves and say, yes, everything looks right? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I wanted to start by thanking Leslie and Claudia for inviting me today and thank everyone also in the audience for being here um, on a Saturday. It's, it's wonderful weather, at least outside my window. So thank you for being here and sacrificing your Saturday morning. And I wanted to start with a land and slavery acknowledgement. Uh, I, thanks to the miracles of technology, I am giving this talk standing on the land that belongs to the Nakochtang people, also known as Anacostans, the native Algonquian people who lived in this area of Washington, D.C. during the 17th century. Their descendants are the Piscataway, and they live today in Prince George's County in Maryland. I also would like to recognize that my institution and myself benefit from historical ties to the institution of slavery. In 1838, 272 men, women, and children were sold as slaves to help secure the future of what is today Georgetown University. This land and slavery acknowledgement is only a small act in an ongoing process of understanding and opposing the systemic oppression and historic and contemporary erasure of indigenous peoples and black peoples. May we all protect and honor the history, the peoples and the languages of these places in the DMV area. So let me start by talking a little bit about multilingualism, autonomy and agency, three important concepts in the talk. The world has always been multilingual. And if you look at the number of official countries that are recognized and the number of languages that have been documented, uh, we see that it's impossible to deny that the world is multilingual. 
the desire for English and English learning in the world just makes people even more multilingual because by definition, these are people who have one or more languages and then come to us for the learning of English. So in fact, L2 English speakers are English knowing multilinguals. That's how we can think of them, including myself. And I want uh, to make sure that we all agree on the definition of multilingual that I have in mind. It's not someone who knows uh, several languages from birth. It's not someone who can pass for a native speaker. Uh, it's not someone who has an equal proficiency in all their languages. Multilinguals are people who are functionally able to use more than one language for their own purposes in life. So how do we teach English while supporting our students to be empowered multilinguals? And what do autonomy and agency have to do with it? I am going to define autonomy as the ability to make decisions and have a say in the direction of one's own language learning. And agency is the ability to change our place in the project of language learning despite known structural constraints. So these structural constraints, um, they, they come to us with our place in the world and they will carry with us in our language learning projects. Um, they include language as a constraint, but also race and ethnicity, class, occupation and wealth, and many other social categorizations that are less or more important in each society and in each community, religion, gender, age, sexual orientation, uh, physical or mental ability or disability. And so in my talk today, I want to give three recommendations to you. One will be to balance form with meaning in your teaching of English. The other one will be to use authentic materials, but also with um, a goal to debunk native speaker models. And finally, to boost agentive motivation. And throughout the three recommendations, I will go, I will keep going back to autonomy and agency. So let me start with recommendation number one, balancing form and meaning, keeping in mind autonomy and agency. Since the 2000s, we have had an emphasis on communication and a rejection of decontextualized grammar teaching in language classrooms and in ESL classrooms. Um, so we all agree, I think by now, that we can still teach grammar and we can teach it well, but we do so if we can balance form with meaning. Um, ever since the early 90s, we have the concept of focus on form that was proposed by Michael Long, and we have a field now called Instructed Second Language Acquisition that focuses on how to teach well and how to teach well grammar while balancing meaning. Um, my own meta-analysis in the year 2000 with uh, John Norris showed that uh, grammar teaching does lead to robust learning, at least as shown on paper and pencil tests, and that explicit grammar teaching leads to better results um, than, than not focusing on the grammar, again, at least as demonstrated on tests. And we have uh, very prominent scholars over the years that have devoted their entire careers to showing how to balance communication with grammar. Um, also, the tradition continues and we continue to have uh, scholars who are now the new generation, um, including Sean Lowen and Masatoshi Sato. Let me give you an example of, uh, of this idea of balancing communication with grammar comes from a study by Andujar, actually in Spain, where I'm from. And um, he decided to use a texting activity in order to keep students focused on both form and meaning. So he used uh, chat and he investigated 40 Spanish EFL students uh, doing WhatsApp um, it was an assignment. They had to post uh, a daily question. Each day, a different student would 
posed the question, and this lasted for six months. And he compared uh, the results with another 40 students who didn't do the WhatsApp assignment. So here's an example of one of the exchanges on WhatsApp. One of the students uh, said, I used to play volleyball at Mondays and Wednesdays. And another student said, you mean you usually play on Mondays and Wednesdays? And the same student responded, yes, ha ha. I'm always confused with usually. So a third student says, ha ha, me too. Is it on Monday or at Monday? So as you see, the student who issued the mistake uh, was corrected by another student through an invitation to reflect and correct. But actually, Marta just missed the point and thought she was doing something else uh, wrong, usually, and not the preposition. And a third student um, helped the second student to complete the correction, to keep suggesting where is the error. And then the teacher finally intervenes by saying, well, you should know it. What's your opinion, girls? So no one really gave the answer directly, but they were negotiating how to do grammar uh, accurately. And in fact, the study showed that in the end, the 40 students who did the WhatsApp activity every day for six months did improve in accuracy in their English grammar, as well as engaged quite a bit with interactions every day in English. So autonomy, as a reminder, is the ability to make decisions and have a say in the direction of our language learning. And through this activity, the students and the teacher were quite free to choose what meanings to make, what to talk about, and how to handle accuracy and grammar learning. So it was very open-ended and it gave students a lot of decision and say um, about their, their grammar learning. But meaning is more complicated than we ever thought. Uh, consider this uh, quote uh, from an ESL teacher's journal who was writing the journal for me. I was her teacher. And um, I'm citing this entry with permission from my student. My student said, once I had a student who kept saying, I came from Korea. So when asked at a party, small talk, where are you from? The student kept saying, I came from Korea. And my student said, I tried to correct her grammar by saying, if you are originally from Korea, you should use present tense when you refer to it. But my student then went on writing and said, my student said, since I don't want to go back to Korea and identify myself with American, I'd rather say I came from Korea and wish to be an American one day. So imagine my, my student was shocked at the answer from her student. And she realized that it was not at all about uh, trying to learn the past tense or trying to correct a grammar rule or trying to make the student more idiomatic, that there was something very deep and profound going on with the student. And that the student was choosing, I came from Korea in the past tense very deliberately and knowing very well what the past tense means in English. So this shows that people want to use language so as to be judged, seen, and heard in desirable ways as they determine what desirable is in their actual and their imagined social worlds. So they want to have a say and they want to have a position for who they want to be in the world. They need to have agency to do this and language is part of being able to exercise that agency. So learning language is about learning to mean, and meanings are social and personal, and also entangled with who we want to be in the world and how we want to see to be seen by others. Let me go to the second recommendation then, which is to support autonomy and agency by using authentic materials while debunking native speaker models. Authentic materials have become valued in language teaching because they help students learn more than just grammar. So they are a, a way of infusing communication in our teaching and of balancing grammar with uh, meaning. If we only teach with sanitized materials, simplified materials, sentence level types of exercises, invented or scripted language, we are stripping meaning out of the grammar. We're taking out the social and the personal meanings that students need to be learning as they learn also the grammar. 
So consider, for example, ordering a meal, uh, an activity or an event that appears quite a bit in a lot of textbooks. Um, let's choose fast food as the type of establishment, and let's think of the social roles we would give to our students. Um, we would tell one student, you are the counter worker, and the other student, you are the customer, right? And then we would have them simulate role play uh, the language of ordering fast food. But what about the social goals of any interaction? There's so much more going on with language every time we do anything with language. For example, when ordering a meal, we may be thinking of our allergies that we have to be careful about as we order, or we may be worrying about the movie we want to go to after we eat, or we may become outraged at being charged extra for the rice or the ketchup or the bread in the order that we're putting in. And so suddenly it's not just about a transactional ordering of something we want to eat, but it really is about including an expression of anxiety or imploring someone to hurry or articulating disapproval at being overcharged for something that we think we shouldn't. So all these things actually is what eventually um, a very advanced proficiency should make us be able to do. That's what it means to be very advanced, very proficient in any language actually, to be able to transact meanings, but also to be able to manage a lot of other meanings that come with even as simple an activity as ordering a hamburger in a McDonald's. So at the same time that we use authentic materials, we should be thinking though, am I choosing these authentic materials to mean that they have been created by native speakers and that they are for native speakers and then I just bring them into the classroom? This is where the second part of recommendation number two comes in. I think we should be very careful to introduce meanings, introduce authentic materials into our classroom with an eye to always watch over whether we are promoting or debunking native speaker models. Um, do we really need to view English learning as a ladder to native speaker perfection? Have you ever noticed how much linguistic insecurity bilinguals feel? Um, this is a very famous um, researcher of bilingualism, Grosjean, who uh, said many bilinguals have a tendency to evaluate their language competencies as inadequate. Some criticize the mastery of language skills. Others strive their hardest to reach monolingual norms. Others still hide their knowledge of their weaker language and most simply do not perceive themselves as being bilingual, even though they use two or more languages regularly. This is a perfect description of linguistic insecurity. So if I asked you in the audience, are you bilingual? Do you consider yourselves to be bilingual or multilingual? I don't know how many of you would raise your hand. But remember that bilingual or multilingual does not necessarily mean that you got your languages from birth, doesn't mean that you are native-like or you can pass for a native speaker. And it doesn't even mean that you are perfectly equally proficient in all your languages. It just means that you're functionally able to use more, one, more than one language for your own purposes in life. And we all have very different purposes for our languages. And maybe each language has actually a different purpose for us and a different place and role in our lives. Yet, the linguistic insecurity that mostly very, very often we feel means that multilinguals and bilinguals frequently experience vulnerability. The vulnerability that comes with being positioned by others as a novice, a foreigner, an outside member, or not a capable speaker. Uh, the vulnerability of uh, being told that their language is not good enough or not good enough yet being told that their ways with language are not appropriate. So often we teachers have the choice to judge what we see in our students as language. Is it linguistic incompetence or is it multilingual flexibility? And remember that 
um, students of language, any language really, are emerging or budding uh, bilinguals or multilinguals. And anyone who comes to us for English, they already have language and therefore they're learning to become multilinguals if they are not already multilinguals when they come to us. So treat them as such. Let's treat our students as bilinguals, multilinguals in the making. And for that, we also need to have a clear notion of what multilingual success may look like. And here I would like to rely on some data that I got many, many years ago from um, a study that I did with Spanish learners in Hawaii. They didn't have very much access to Spanish outside the classroom. And here this 20 year old female student uh, told me the following in an interview. Unless you're a native speaker, you're not gonna be able to speak perfect. I mean, we're still English speakers, you know? Because I mean, you want to say it correctly, but I don't think you need to say it always correct. I think you can always get a, away with it or get along the idea in a basic way. Yeah, you want to say it correctly, but it'll come through repetition and going over more and more or being among people that speak correctly all the time. So this student seems to have a very realistic attitude towards native speaker perfection. If you're not a native speaker of a language, you're not going to be a native speaker of that language. Duh. And also she seems to think that um, there, is, there is a realistic idea of how communication really works. You can always get a, a, away with it. You can always get along the idea in a basic way. Uh, I think some of us teachers at some point in our career may interpret this uh, as a form of laziness, but I prefer to interpret it um, as a realistic idea of how communication really works. And also this person has great confidence that success is perfectly possible and that realistic, uh, realistically to learn a language what it takes is a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of models. But notice that she doesn't say native speaker models. She says being around people who speak it correctly all the time, whether they are native or non-native. So at the other end of things, linguistic insecurity can be paralyzing. In the same study, another student who had very different attitudes towards accuracy said, I don't know, especially when I speak in another language, I'm always conscious of making sentences correct, even if I don't say anything worth listening to. I was shocked by this last addition. Even if I don't say anything worth listening to, I need to be correct. And the sense of powerlessness can be internalized dangerously by students. So this comes from a study in the 70s where Eva, was um, a, a young woman who had been born in China, moved to Australia at the age 16, and then to the US at the age 19. And she said this to the researcher, uh, I have never started anything from A, B, C, D. Everything is always skip, 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 since I've been going so many places. I wasn't taught the way a person is supposed to be taught. I wasn't taught in the right way. So that is why some of the grammars are, were never drilled into me. So this person is, is showing a tremendous amount of powerlessness and dejection at, you know, I'm beyond repair. I was never taught how a person is supposed to be taught. I was never taught in the right way. <clears throat> and now probably she feels it's too late. So <clears throat> for this person, Excuse me, I need to take some water. <clears throat> For Eva, agency really is, seems to be very low. She doesn't seem to feel that she has the ability to change her place <clears throat> in the project of language learning. And she doesn't seem to feel like the structural constraints brought about in, in her life as an immigrant constantly changing places is something that she can fight against or overcome. So use authentic materials, balance, form, and meaning, yes, but also help yourself and your students out of native speakerism 
and instead help you and help them build linguistic confidence. Because if they are confident linguistically, they will want to keep learning and using the language. They need to feel proud of who they are in all their languages before they can invest in more language learning. And finally, the recommendation uh, that comes third, last but not least, as we say, is putting agentive motivation uh, at the forefront of our teaching. Uh, when our students are motivated, everything works well. We all know that as good teachers. The research is also tremendously helpful in this area because we have plenty of evidence that motivation really matters in all kinds of ways, including for better language learning, for more persistent efforts and time into learning the language. So we have the first, the, the seminal generation, the, the founders of modern motivation theory in second language learning. We have many more researchers now um, as the new generation that started in the uh, 2020s. Um, we also have researchers um, who investigate motivation in very difficult contexts, like in East Asia, the motivation to learn English seems to be an uphill battle and in China as well. Um, and then we also have other researchers uh, investigating motivation to learn anything but English by speakers who um, already have English. And again, it's an uphill battle for them. So our US domestic students who think that with English they have enough and they don't want to learn other languages. But motivation doesn't always win because autonomy is also necessary. Autonomy meaning the very psychological idea that we need to be able to make decisions and have a say in the direction of our own language learning. So here's um, another study from the late 90s uh, from Fiona Highland. And this was uh, done in New Zealand. Samorn was a Thai graduate student. She was over 30 years old and she was doing a degree in business. And this is what she said to Fiona Highland uh, in an interview. She says, at the first time, I think that my writing is good because friends always say that it's good. But my teachers say that I have to have a lot of writing because it's not so good. And at the first time, I feel confident of my writing because I think that my grammar, my tense and my plural and verb use with plural, with singular is okay. But when the feedback come out, teacher doesn't look enough in that grammar. The grammar is not the most important thing for her. So she check in the coherence, in the introduction, in something else. And I haven't got good marks. So I think that I am poor in everything of writing. I think that my grammar is good, but I didn't get any comments that, oh, your grammar is good, but you still have to, you still have to correct about something like this but all the comments come that my writing is not so good. So I feel that everything is poor. I think that at least she should admire me some points. From that time, I discouraged a lot and I feel don't like writing. So someone is very proud of her own grammar accomplishments. And by reading this excerpt, we may be surprised as ESL teachers thinking, well, there's a lot of things in the grammar that need to be um, tweaked. Um, but she is very proud at her grammar, perhaps because she's comparing herself with other friends uh, who have less grammar than she does, right? And then she gets the feedback from the writing teacher is all focused on the writing, on issues, uh, the macro issues of writing. And there is no praise and there is no praise for grammar, right? So some, someone is really demotivated by that. Now, the question is, could someone have made her secret motivations and frustrations known to her teacher? Could she have said something to the teacher, shared with the teacher that she was so surprised at not receiving any praise for her wonderful grammar? Could someone's teacher have been more proactive asking her about her secret motivations and frustrations with the class and with the, written, the writing feedback that she was giving someone? 
This is what we call agentic engagement, a concept from general education that I like a lot from Reem and Shin. And it's, it's defined as the degree to which students make their secret motivations public in class and known to teachers. Now, this is a tall order. Many students may very much hesitate to make their secret motivations public in our class and known to us. But there are things that would sound to us and look to us as agentic motivation engagement. Uh, for example, if a student said, well, reading Shakespeare is nice, but I would prefer to watch the movie version, may we do that? Or could we press, practice this language in a real setting and not just memorize note cards? Or may we work with a partner right now for the thing that you just told us we need to work on? Or could you show me how to do this? Could you give me an example? Could we have a little bit more time? So asking for accommodations, for examples, for help from the teacher. So how do we support students' agentic engagement so that they, they dare telling us these things in class? Um, we should be asking our students regularly, what are you interested in? What do you want to learn about? And then act upon it by bringing into the classroom the authentic materials, the activities, the projects, the topics that they are, can engage with. And also, let's just think about what our own students would say if they were asked to react to statements like, my teacher is responsive or unresponsive to my opinions. My teacher is indifferent or interested in how I feel. If we feel like our students would say, yes, she's responsive, yes, she's interested, then we are having a, a, a learning uh, classroom environment, a, a, an atmosphere of agentic engagement, and that's great. If we're a little bit hesitant and we're unsure how our students would respond, or we feel some will respond, but yes, we're responsive and interested in how they feel, but others may be a little bit more skeptical in their responses, then we know that we're reaching some students and they are uh, engaging agentically with us and our teaching. But perhaps we do know that a few students in the class are, are just not as motivated and as engaged, as able to feel that they can exercise their agency with us. And notice that for agentic engagement to happen, we need to have appropriate supports in place and I wanted to give an example of access to the first language as appropriate support that oftentimes we ESL teachers may neglect. An example that comes from a student of mine who is now teaching English to newcomers and she's uh, herself from Iran. So she speaks uh, Farsi, which is very intelligible with Dari, the, the language of her students. And so she, she shared this example with me and I found it very, very powerful. Um, and we are going to have a lot of newcomers into our community colleges, our schools, um, our society. Right? So this newcomer said, my wife needs a sewing machine so that she can make some money. That was just what the newcomer was able to communicate to my student. He had to communicate it to her in Farsi because he doesn't speak any English and he wasn't able to, he wouldn't have been able to make this known to anyone like the agencies that are helping them or other teachers that he's learning English from. So now the family has gotten a swim machine. Uh, my student tells me and things are looking a little bit better for, for this family of newcomers. So agency autonomy was agentic engagement and motivation. And in some cases, unless we put a lot of extra support in place, it cannot really happen. Uh, but agency is also necessary. And agency is the ability to change our place, our place in the world and our place in the project of language learning, despite structural constraints that are well known. And agency nurtures itself from positive and negative ideologies, as I will show right now. Um, this is a study by a former colleague of mine and dear friend, uh, Nick Subtirelu, 
and he was examining confidence and willingness to communicate, the relationship between being confident linguistically and uh, being willing to communicate in English and use English. So he did interviews with international students um, on a campus in the US, on a university campus in the US. And every two months, over eight months, uh, he would talk to them. And the main topic of their interviews was, can you tell me about times when you had difficulty or negative encounters using English? And so in the study, he focuses on three students, Abu from Saudi Arabia, DK from China and Fahad from Saudi Arabia as well. All three of them reported a lot of difficult or negative encounters using English with people on the campus. And in fact, Fahad reported the most of them, 25 such events over eight months. That's a lot of traumatic events per month. So in the end though, through these conversations, Abu and DK were explaining these difficulties in communication by blaming themselves 100% on their non-nativeness and on their not so good English. They kept saying, I understand no one wants to talk to me because my English is so bad, I need to improve, I need to study more. No one can understand my pronunciation, etc." cetera. Fahad, on the other hand, who had the most such difficult encounters and of a very similar nature, um, he never explained these difficulties by saying, it's my poor English. He would always talk about a situation of 50-50 blame, 50%, 50% blame. He would mention a lot that the interlocutors, native or not, sometimes weren't that helpful. And so who in these two positionings of why the difficulties, where do the difficulties come from with English and English communication, who is going to be better off? Abu and Decay, who will study a lot more, but apparently they were avoiding communicating and using English, or Fahad, who never avoided uh, further interactions. Apparently he had developed a lingua franca ideology where he wasn't ready to just blame it on himself, but he did understand that communication is a two-way street. Um, in another study in Canada, uh, Tracy Derwin asked uh, ESL students, what, you know, what do you think of your accents? How do you feel about your accents? This was a really large study with 100 immigrants in, in a community college in Edmonton, Canada. And so some of those students showed this lingua franca ideology uh, by saying things like, well, they, meaning the interlocutors, the, the other people they, they would use English with, they don't pay attention to you if your English uh, isn't good. They don't listen as carefully to people who have an accent. When I work for a company, my colleagues don't understand. They joke, I feel very bad very often. Accent is more important than race. I don't even know why that comment came out of that student, but it's an interesting and significant, I think, one. Accent is more important than race. Perhaps discrimination against accents seems to be even bigger than discrimination against race. And another comment very telling comment of a lingua franca ideology. Sometimes people choose not to understand. So it's not my poor English always. Sometimes it's people willfully rejecting my English. So uh, to me, it's interesting that we can have students with both types of ideologies. And then the question to me is, how can we cultivate uh, positive ideologies over negative ideologies? Um, so that learning and well-being can proceed better. I think teachers can help their students develop empowering strategies of resilience and agency so that they can transform their worlds and negotiate the liabilities of being multilinguals in our monolingually biased societies. Um, if we focus on agency, on how to support and how to foster and encourage in our students 
the ability to change their place in the project of language learning and in view of the structural constraints that they're not going to be able to avoid, but that they may be able to negotiate in small ways and in big ways. And here, the notion of intersectionality is very important, uh, proposed by Crenshaw um, quite a few years ago. She said that we can only understand experiences of oppression and systems of oppression if we understand the intersections of race, multiple other social identities, and the associated isms that arise in every community and in every context, in every nation state. Um, so she, of course, was thinking about race and ethnicity very, very prominently as it intersects with class and occupation, with religion, with gender, with social orientation, with age, with ability. For us as language teachers, obviously language is also at the intersection of all these things. And the more we can help our students negotiate language and language learning as part of the intersection of these known constraints uh, in our society, the more we can actually support both language learning and agency and happiness uh, in their lives in meeting their goals. So in conclusion, how do we teach English while supporting our students to be empowered multilinguals? And what do autonomy and agency have to do with it? Remember that the two concepts are sort of related, but a little bit different um, in <clears throat> origin. So autonomy is more a psychological concept. It looks inside the individual perhaps and, and says, you know, do I have a say over my learning? Do I have the capacity to make decisions? Am I allowed by others? Do I negotiate the ability to make decisions? That's autonomy. And agency is a bit more socially constructed, a bit more structural. And it's about how much, to what extent do I have the ability to change my reality, my place in the world, um, the project of language learning in which I am engaged, um, in view that I am going to fight against uh, structural constraints uh, that, that we all acknowledge, but sometimes we live outside of the classroom. So there we go, that were my three recommendations to focus on balancing form and meaning, but with a very clear understanding of what meaning really is in language, to uh, rethink the roles of authentic materials and native speakers. Yes, we want authenticity in the language we bring into the classroom, but authenticity does not come from trying to um, ensure that the language we teach uh, is modeled after native speakers. And finally, boosting agentive motivation is very, very important. And both autonomy and agency are going to have to do with it. So for students to want to keep learning and using English, they need to feel proud of who they are in all their languages. So this is a matter of linguistic confidence and a multilingual view of success that we share and communicate with them. Um, they need to feel that they have a say over their learning, and this is a matter of autonomy. And they also need to see possibilities for change um, in their English language learning projects. And they need to be able to feel that they can change these language learning projects for the better despite structural constraints. So do keep balancing form and meaning, keep language meaningful, personal with choice, support linguistic confidence, expose students to authentic rich materials, help them question native speakerism, help them develop multilingual notions of success, and boost agentive motivation. Understand their intersectional places in the world. You as a teacher, they also need to understand them and become aware of them. And then create conditions in the classroom for their agentic engagement with their own learning and help them nurture agency. Thank you very much. And I hope we have time for questions and to interact. Thank you.
Thank you, Lourdes. That was incredible. <laughs> I was so, uh, I lost track of time. You know, I looked at the time, I'm like, where did it go? So why don't we open it up for some Q&A here? Um, if you'd like to type in your question or if you want yes. to unmute. Yes, um, yes. Hello. Um, yes. Uh, this is for Dr. Ortega. Are you familiar with culturally responsive teaching, social emotional learning, and differentiated instruction for English language instruction? Those three things. Have you done research in primarily K through 12 topics? Yes, absolutely. All three are very important and all three are ways of implementing and putting into practice the principles that I was talking about. To yeah. validate, affirm, build and bridge and using translanguaging and uh, you utilize uh, literacy oriented versus non, some students are not from a highly literate, highly educated background versus others. And we have to acknowledge their funds of knowledge that they bring to, to put it to good use. And how much, are you familiar with social emotional learning that's used in K through 12 for self-management, self-awareness, self social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making? Not in K, it's more in K through 12 than in, in adult ed and college world settings. Yes, absolutely. Those are all wonderful principles and they get at autonomy and agency um, and a lot of self, um, self-regulation of learning. And those, the first set of principles and translanguaging are very, very specific to language teaching. And these other set of uh, principles and, and practices are very useful across any kind of learning, not just language, but any kind of learning. Thank you. That's great. And Lucy has also said, um, I, Lucy, I don't know if you actually want to say this, but you believe in the power of words. Do you want to actually say what you wanted to say there? Hello, everybody. I'm Lucy. And what I wrote is that I really think that our words can be really, really powerful to help our students. What I mean by that is that once, I mean, five years ago, I was in the classroom in the TSO program. I was there because I wanted to improve my English. I was not there because I wanted to teach English because in my mind, how come I, you know, how come I would teach a language that is not my first language? In my mind, I didn't have this power. So a teacher came to me, I never forget her words. And she's here today, she's my boss. <laughs> and she came to me and she said, I wish you could see the potential that I can see in you, Lucy. And this changed my life completely. I started to think about this. Oh my gosh, I have this potential, you know, potential, and I can do a good job. And this helped me to change my mindset. I've been teaching in Westchester Community College for six years. I've been very successful. I love my students. I can help them a lot to change their mindset and to see that they can do it. So thank you, Claudia Carco. You made a difference in my life. And I feel very emotional when I talk about this because she really helped me to see the potential and she really helped me to see that I could do it. And I've been doing for six years. That's my words. This so teachers, <laughs> we can change their mindset. There are a lot of fear when it comes to speak a second language, the fear of being judged, the, the fear of being mispronounced the words, the, the fear of, you know, make mistakes. And that negative voice telling us that you cannot do it, you have an accent. People are going to make joke the way you speak. So this can really stop us. So if our teacher we as a teacher encourage them, you can do it. You know, your English is good. It's okay to have an accent. What are you talking about? You know what I mean? So thank you so much. That I was not expecting to say anything, but <laughs> this is really special to me because, oof, what Aww. else? Thank you, thank you. I just, yeah, want, to, I just want to say that it's a wonderful um, com complementarity between Robert's uh, comment and Luciana's comment 
yeah. Robert is telling us there's a lot of professional knowledge that one can draw from to teach really well and to address all these issues. And Luciana is telling us, and there is a lot of interpersonal knowledge that grows out of the relationship between a student and a teacher. And in the, Luciana, in the uh, research on motivation, there is a concept that I love, which is called inspiring teachers. So students who are motivated to learn a language, they have been found almost inevitably and always have a teacher that they remember vividly over the years and after years that inspired them. And these are inspiring teachers. So Lord, obviously Lord, Claudia was your inspiring teacher. And now I'm sorry to stop you, but now my students come to me and say, Lucy, you inspire me every day. I look at you and I see if you did, I can do it. Of course you can do it, I tell them. You know, 10 years ago, I was sitting in the classroom just like you learning the language. You know, and it's 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 beautiful. It's powerful. It's like ooh, it's it's amazing. It's it's like a magic, you know. And oh, thank you, Lucy. I just wrote because you you really always make me very emotional. You know, when you share your story, and I remember that moment. You know, I, it touched my life forever too. So thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I was going to ask you, Lourdes, actually, because I think this is something that our students really struggle with. You know, how do we break that that notion of you have, you know, of students wanting to sound native like and telling them, you know, it's OK. But you touched on this, you know, their perception of maybe, you know, of others thinking that they're not smart or that they're not capable. Right. So how do yeah. how can, you, can we break this for our students? Well, I think some students have this perfectionism that is not a bad thing, but it's a good thing. It's a, it's a positive ideology that propels them to invest more time and effort. If that's the case, some, some students do come to me with this aspiration to sound like a native speaker, but I can tell that they are working hard for it and that they may get quite, quite good at pronunciation. So more power to them. I'm not going to crush that kind of a, an aspiration if I think that you know that they're on a on a good path and it's gonna pay off for them somehow. But for others, it's it's the same aspiration, but it's in a negative ideology package. And so they they feel that they cannot speak and they feel they cannot learn and they feel they will never be successful uh, users of English because of their pronunciation being different from that of a native speaker. And then I work with them to unpack that and to make them realize that there are many, many of us with accents and the world is full of people with accents um, and some are successful and some are not. And it's usually not, let's not kid ourselves. We are language teachers, so we tend to overvalue the role of language in everything, but let's not uh, forget that uh, success in life comes from a lot of other constraints that are structural, systemic, and doors open a little bit with better English, but a lot of doors do not open and it's regardless of the good English that our students have. So I always feel very scared about <clears throat> not discussing that with them. You know, racism, uh, classism, ageism, uh, ableism, there are many other things that are going to impact our students' ability to meet their goals in life. And language is part of it, but it's not going to be the door that then erases all these other uh, very, very important challenges. I just want to add to that because actually Karen Davis um, has already said has also said it's great to listen to ideas deeply rooted in shared humanity and anti-oppression and i mean that's that's it right any other questions for lourdes before we say goodbye <laughs> amelia yeah, sorry, I was trying to type it, but I didn't type fast enough. But um, <laughs> I 
have, I actually had a, a question about, um, about some of the things you said about motivation and um, this experience I've, I've had, and maybe hopefully other people have had this feeling like sometimes my, the students will, will kind of ghost me a little bit when they, um, especially in the lower level, when they just kind of, they'll stop coming and sort of fall off the, um, mm -hmm. the radar. And sometimes I've written to them saying, you know, noticed you've missed some classes, sorry, excuse me. Um, and they, you know, um, and, and it's, there's a kind of, sometimes they'll come back, but sometimes they won't respond. And it does seem like there's some sort of like motivation that's been lost, but also there's this kind of shame, feeling of shame that they have, that, you know, they're not, they don't, it feels like they're even uncomfortable responding to the question of where they are. Um, so I was just kind of wondering um, how to use, maybe use some of these motivational strategies that you've mentioned to address that. Mm -hmm. I, I would say, first of all, <clears throat> it's clear that <clears throat> when a student shows uh, low motivation, this affects our motivation as teachers as well. So we feel demotivated when we see disengagement uh, in some students. We have to watch for our own uh, affective well being when that happens. And we also should be very careful not to attribute to our own teaching the, the uh, many things that can make a student drop out or stop coming to class or not respond to our emails. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about, Amelia, because I've also experienced it and seen it, and especially during these two years of COVID, it's, it's been a, a tremendous uh, worry, I think, for all of us teachers. What happens to the students who don't show their, you know, they, they keep their camera off, or then they stop coming to the classes online or in person, or we reach out and we write to them and they don't respond. And yeah, people who drop out. Again, it's not just what we teach, how we teach. It's also the other person is a full person with a full life, right? So many times the lack of engagement and the lack of motivation is not against us but it is a result of many other dynamics in people's lives. The question is whether we can do something to bring back the student. And sometimes we may be able to, and other times we just may not because of the circumstances and the life realities that made that person um, not be able to engage with learning. Um, but all we can do is always try, always reach out, right? And sometimes that has been enough and other times it hasn't been. Um, but the more we're sort of like trying to, while we have the students in our class, try to bring in them into what we teach and how we teach it, the more we perhaps are uh, in a position then to reach out if someone cannot come to class or stops coming to class uh, because we have established a bond because we know more about their lives. So instead of just asking what's happening, why aren't you coming to class? You know, we miss you in class, we want you back. Um, the reaching out may have more personal content, more reality in the content. If we have been able to learn a little bit more about our student in the two, three, four sessions where they were coming. So oftentimes when I finish a semester, I look back um, and I think, oh, okay, let me go through the list of students. How much do I know about each of them? And I, I feel that if, if I know quite a lot about all of them, that was a good semester. And sometimes I've surprised myself and I felt like, oh, I don't know, half of the class, I don't really know a whole lot about them as people specifically, right? I know, I know them in class, where I know their assignments, I know their language, uh, how they write or they speak, but I don't know much more about them. And then I felt like, okay, maybe this semester I wasn't so great with this class. So the more we are bringing in things into the classroom that does, don't come from us, but it comes from our students, 
the more we're establishing some shared ground that when things go wrong and they can go wrong for many other reasons, not because of our teaching, we have a little bit more of ammunition and content to try to reach out. Thank you, that was very helpful. Thank you. We're not perfect. <laughs> We're human beings, we teachers as well, right? So. Uh, Amelia? Because those are at-risk students, Ms. Martin. Those are at-risk students with a lot of personal problems. Long before COVID ever happened, they have family support issues, health insurance, home, food insecurity, and then unfortunately COVID augmented it even more. We need to take that into consideration. And even if COVID were gone, those issues would still persist. We need to be that. I want to share this to Ms. Martin yeah. about the at-risk adult students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The structural constraints, we all are complicit with them, we all participate of them, but um, they really are in the system. So it's, we all live with them and we need to not think that everything depends on us as individual teachers or the students as individual students. Anything after Ms. Morton, like she should add something else for Ms. Morton. I'm sorry. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Amelia, for that great question. And Lourdes, we can't thank you enough for spending your Saturday with us and sharing your expertise and your passion, you know, for this field. And thank you. We're forever indebted to you. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all. <laughs> it's a pleasure. And uh, I just love seeing so many names. And I know each of you is doing great things in your teaching. Just to be here on a Saturday, that means you are <laughs> very engaged teachers. So uh, yeah, enjoy the weekend and, and thank you for being here. Thank you everyone. Have a great weekend. See you soon. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Mitch. Is Mitch still here? Oh, okay. You weren't, I can't stop uh, the recording, I don't think. All right, I'll stop it for you, no problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank Bye, you. Nice